Right, open your Bibles this morning to the book of Acts. And the book of Acts chapter 2 is where we will be. As we continue on and co conclude our series in the book of Acts chapter 2. And we don't have to go into Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4 as well. But uh, mainly Acts chapter 2, looking at the early days of the church. We looked at the day of Pentecost. We looked at the healing of a lame man. We looked at the occasions where the early apostles were arrested, were beaten, were threatened not to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. Uh, some exciting things in the early days of the church. And it's in those times of adversity and in these early days that we get to see the true nature of the church. And so it is appropriate and it is necessary that we as a young church would go to these passages and would ask some questions and seek the answers. Ask the question specifically about what should we be? How should we be? What should we be doing as the church? And what should it look like? And one of the things that, uh, one of the items that I added in as on our sheet here of our vision for Dearborn, uh, to establish a local church in Dearborn for Dearborn, one of those is that we would have a church with a compelling atmosphere. Right. Um, I add this in there because it's something that I've experienced myself. The church that I grew up in and the church that has sent us out here, Emmanuel Baptist Church, is a very compelling church. Um, I definitely did not leave Emmanuel Baptist Church because I wanted to get out of there. It's, it's an amazing church. It's, a, it's a, a, a very unique church, and it's a church that I'd be glad to spend the rest of my life in. Um, it, it is a compelling church, but it's a church that is compelling in a way that part of our desire to start a church here in Dearborn is to replicate what we have there in Corinth. Uh, we want to take the spirit of that church and reproduce it in another place. And that is what church planting ought to be. It ought to be a church that is reproducing itself. And the church that comes from a church ought to be like the one that it came from. Uh, as the animals reproduce after their kind, so should the churches. And so part of when I talk about being a compelling church, I, I speak in some ways from my experience. And perhaps some of you in the past have been parts of other churches that you would say was a compelling church. Perhaps you've been part of other churches at times that maybe weren't a compelling church or went through seasons where the church wasn't compelling. What do I mean by compelling? Something that is compelling is something that is um, exciting, something that is attractive, something that has that element that kind of draws you in and, and kind of sweeps you up in it, something that you want to be a part of, something you want to identify with, something that is exciting. There's an energy there and there's a spirit there that, that whatever it is, you want it as a part of your life. Our desire is that the church here in Dearborn would be a church like that, a church that is welcoming to people, a church that is hospitable, but a church that has an attitude and a spirit that is attractive to people. Something that people walk away from feeling refreshed, feeling excited, feeling like, I want to go back to that place. Right. Uh, we don't want a church that is, people are only here by, um, by requirement, or people are only here out of a sense of guilt or, or a sense of necessity. They're not only here because we asked them to be here or we pushed them in or, or convinced them or tricked them to be here. We want a place that is full of people who have gathered together willingly, gladly, of their own accord because they want to be together. Amen. Because they want to worship Christ together. They have a shared vision. They have shared values that are, are some of the um, some of the components, some of the ingredients that make a compelling church. There are a lot of things that I could talk about today as far as making a church a compelling church. We could talk about the music. Music's a big part of it. You want music that is alive, that is spirit-filled, that isn't worldly. Uh, music that uplifts the Savior. Music that um, is, is appropriate for, for worship. That's part of it. Uh, we could talk about music. We could talk about design. Uh, I like to design things. I like things to look good and attractive and look nice. We don't want to look like uh, uh, we, we don't care about things. We, we could talk about dress. I think that the way a pastor dresses is important. It's, it's not necessary for a pastor to wear a shirt, suit and tie, but a pastor ought to dress as though he respects the office of a pastor, respects the Word of God, and respects the work that he is doing in preaching the Word of God. It ought to be, uh, it ought to be dress that reflects respect. Uh, we can talk about dress, we can talk about music, we can talk about a lot of things, but I want to focus on the scriptures this morning, because that's where we've been. And I want to look at Acts chapter 2, specifically at the end of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. 
we get a little snapshot at the end of Acts chapter 2, which is amazing. It, it summarizes some of the activity of the early church. And for the purpose of today's message, though, we could talk about so many other things that makes the church attractive as well. And these people were rejoicing that they received the word, but then what did they have faith? Glad they received his word were baptized. Here's one of the first ingredients of this compelling church. They had some compelling conversions. And a compelling it's compelling when somebody gets saved. But you know what's really compelling? When somebody gets saved and then they get baptized. Baptism is, is compelling. It's an exciting activity of the church. Because baptism itself is a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of salvation. It's a public declaration of your faith in Christ and of your allegiance to Christ. And it's an exciting thing. You ever been to a, a baptism service? It's almost always exciting to see somebody make that step. We always follow, uh, we usually sing, I have decided to follow Jesus, because it's a decision that somebody has made. Baptism is not <laughs> part of your salvation. It's an important distinction. Some people have been using these verses to try to equate baptism with salvation. But baptism in no way saves a person. Uh, baptism is simply a picture of salvation. It, it's an important element because the Bible commands, uh, the Bible clearly associates salvation with baptism, that it ought to follow salvation. Uh, as Baptists, one of our distinctives is that we believe in something called believer's baptism, that people ought to be baptized after they are saved. To baptize somebody before they've received Christ, uh, you're picturing something that hasn't happened to them. Uh, you're picturing so, the, the two don't match. Uh, only somebody who has received Christ but already been regenerated, already been saved, can be baptized because what's happening when we baptize somebody, they go under the water as a picture of the burial of Jesus Christ. He died and he was buried, but that three days later he rose again. And so the, the baptism pictures the complete gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it's an amazing picture. It's an important picture. But more than a picture of salvation, we see baptism here is used as an entrance into the church. Entrance into church membership, we could say. Uh, we read that they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Uh, these people who were saved and then baptized were then added to the church. They were added into the company of the church. They were added into the gathering of the church. This is where we start to define and distinguish what makes a church a church and what makes somebody part of a church or not part of a church. Uh, there, there are some distinguishing lines here, and we, we can see them very well defined in this three-step process that we see here in Acts chapter 2. Gladly received his word, baptized, added to the church. There's an order here. There, there's a sequence here. There, there are multiple steps that are taking place in a specific order. We talk about church membership, but I'm afraid membership is a word that has lost some of its meaning or lost some of its substance because we have so many memberships today. You probably have a gym membership. You probably have a, a Netflix membership. You probably have uh, some kind of club membership. You probably have a library membership. We have, you know, if we were just, I have, uh, if we were just going to our wallets and you know, you look at and you have, you know, credit cards and things, but you probably also have like membership cards. Let me see if I actually have one. Oh, look at this. I am a Barnes and Noble member. Noble <laughs> member. Uh, that's good for 10% off any purchase, all right? I have this a membership, all right? It, it's something I've identified with Barnes & Noble. It's, something, it's, a, it's an organization that I frequent, and I go there and I spend time, and I thought, hey, I'm going to take the next step. I'm going to become a member there. And there are perks that come with membership there. Um, let's see. You're going to learn everything about me right now. Um, look at that. A Henry Ford member, all right? I figure I'm going to be a Dearborn local. I should be a Henry Ford member. Uh, so I can go to the museum and go to all the new exhibits and things like that, all right? So you get, you get perks as a member. Right. You get special access to events. You get discounts. You get all these kinds of things. Um, but I'm sure every one of you have similar things. Look at that library membership. Um, we come, come to associate membership in these ways. We think about membership in the sense of the things that it does for us. I get a discount. I get access. Uh, all all of, uh, membership ought to come with, with perks. Right. Uh, in that way. And, and if we're not careful, we'll start to associate church membership like one of these yeah. mm. memberships where I pay a due, I pay a service, 
I give my money, I should have special access. I give money, I should have special access to the pastor. I should have special access to, to information. I should, have, uh, I should have special authority or special say or some kind of perk. I don't know what, what expectations people have, but uh, membership can be associated with perks. Membership can just be associated with benefits for you. But church membership is not like that. Church membership is something more than that. It's something greater than that. Church membership is something that you're not just getting something from it, although there are many wonderful benefits to being a member of a local church. But church membership is something that you're giving yourself to. You are, a better idea than membership is enlistment. You're not just joining something that's going to serve you. You are joining an organization intending to serve it. Right. I'm giving myself to the church. I intend to serve the church. Yeah. I intend to give whatever benefit I have to the church. It, it is in a way like military enlistment. I'm signing up for service. I'm, I'm enlisting myself. It's like perhaps not just joining the military, but maybe perhaps um, enrolling uh, in, in or, or joining a sports team. You sign up and, and you're in, but now there's an expectation of you, right? That you're going to serve in certain ways, that you're going to practice, that you're going to uh, show up on game days. There becomes expectations of you. And so these people, they were saved and they were baptized and they were added to the church. We could call it a membership. We could call it a number of things. But, but in a sense, they were putting their name down. They were adding themselves to the ranks of those people. They were associating themselves together. They were joining a body of believers. And in baptism, they were declaring their allegiance to Jesus Christ and their allegiance to everyone else, all the other members of the church. Church membership is a compelling concept. Baptism is a real compelling activity of the church. It's a celebration of the gospel, and it is an enlistment of the saints. It's an important activity. It's something that a church ought to do. And so you'll see on our, our list, we plan to have a baptism on Easter Sunday. That's a good day to baptize people, right? Amen. Uh, what we're recognizing on Easter Sunday is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what better way to recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ than to baptize? It is the activity that, that is appointed by Christ himself to represent his resurrection. And so if anyone here is interested in baptism, if you've never been scripturally baptized, we invite you to be baptized with us on Easter Sunday. I'd like to meet with you and talk, make sure you understand what baptism is, what it represents. But that's something that we intend to do. And it's something we tend to do in a public way. Baptism is meant for the world to see it. It's meant to be something that uh, the community and the world sees and understands that, that this person is, is a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And that they've even followed his example of baptism giving themselves to them. We see compelling conversions. I'm all for people getting saved, but I'm really for people getting saved and baptized and added to the church. Amen. That's the formula here. Because that's like uh, not just taking step one, but step two and step three. And, right. and, and, and following after Christ, continuing in that obedience. And it's much more public in that way. And it has much greater effect on the people around them, the people in the community. Are able to publicly proclaim Christ in baptism. That's a compelling thing. And a church that is adding members, a church that is baptizing people, is a compelling church. We see not only compelling conversions, but we see a compelling level of commitment amongst these people. Look at verse 42. We read, somehow I'm in Romans. Okay, there we go. Acts chapter 42. And they... Uh, they did glad they received the word were baptized, saying they were added 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. Hmm. The discipleship curriculum that we started using is called Continue, and it's from this verse, in that the, these early Christians, they continued steadfastly right. in the Apostles' Doctrine. Yeah. There was a high level of commitment from these early Christians. Mm -hmm. They were committed people. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that they continued, meaning they didn't stop, right? They, they kept going. They continued, and then they continued, and then they continued, and then they continued. They didn't let anything hold them back from their commitment to the church. Uh, they continued, the Bible says, steadfastly. 
The idea of steadfast is the idea of, of unmoving, unwavering. It, it's a dedicated level of commitment. And, and what, what about that makes a church compelling? What about that level of commitment makes a church something that is attractive to people, something that, that gets people's attention? Well, it, it's the fact that other people can see that level of commitment. Mm -hmm. They can see, wow, that person really believes all this stuff. <laughs> that person is really committed. That, that, it's really, it's, it shows that it's real yeah, in your life, yeah. that level of commitment. But, but it shows, like I said, we want to be a church of people that are gathered together willingly, right? Uh, we want to be a church that are people that are gathered together by conviction, <coughs> that desire to be in the church, that love the church, that love each other, that love each other's company, that love to gather together with the saints, that love the activity of the church. <clears throat> Has anybody ever gone to a prison? Ever been to a prison? No, I, you know, you know, not, not not as an inmate, but you ever visited or seen? Okay, I've had to go and, and be around a prison. I was going to pick on Brother James today because he was a corrections officer, but he's not here today. He's they just had a baby. Uh, but but he spent a lot of time in prison um, as a corrections officer. But you ever been to a prison? You don't go there and think, wow, this is a place where I want to be. Yeah. I got I to gotta come back to this place. I'd love to spend more time here. Uh, I've spent very little time like working in a prison and stuff, and it's like, you want to get out of that place. Why? Nobody's there willingly. It's not a place where anybody chose to go. Uh, and, and a church ought not be like that. You can tell when church is a place where people are there by obligation, or they're forced to be there. They're, they have some external pressure that's making them go. They're going for some appearance. They're going out of some level of guilt. Church ought not feel like a prison. Nobody is forced to be here. You don't have to come. We want church to be a place that people come willingly, gladly. A commitment that is not coercion. There are a lot of reasons why somebody might go to a church. And not all of them are good reasons. But when everybody is here for the right reasons and the same reasons, out here just out of a love for Christ right. and a love for the Word of God and a love for each other, that's the kind of thing that people are going to see, they're going to know, and they're going to come. Amen. These people continued steadfast. There was a high level of commitment in them that was from the heart. It was a real commitment. And it's something that spurred on more growth. There was an internal motivation that motivated their continued activity in the church. Part of the job of a shepherd is to encourage all right, and, and, and part of my job, I'm going to encourage all of you to be in church. When somebody falls away from church or somebody misses a week, I'm going to reach out to them. I'm going to check on them. I'm going to call. I'm going to text. I'm maybe going to drop by if I don't see somebody for a little while. Because that's what a shepherd does. A shepherd watches out for the sheep, and a shepherd encourages and, and motivates. And, and it's part of uh, what I do to, to kind of encourage people, to say it nicely, to go to church. Because I think it's good for their souls. Amen. But if everybody is simply here because a pastor pressured them to be, it's not going to give us that compelling environment. If, 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 if people are only here because uh, somebody dragged them here, people are going to feel that. We're going to lose that compelling excitement of steadfast continuation out of heart. They were unwavering. They were firm. They had compelling conversions that were evidenced by baptisms, exciting baptisms. They had a compelling level of commitment that was a real sign of their love for Christ and for each other. One of the other elements we see in verse 42 is they had a compelling content. <laughs> I wanted to say compelling curriculum. I want content. Compelling content. What did they continue in? The Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. What were they coming to do? What was it that drew them to this place? What was it that brought them into the church every day and every week, constantly? What was it that gave them this high level of steadfast continuance? It was the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Right. It was the word of God. It was the presence of the word of God that made this a compelling church. It was the presence of the word of God that made it a place where people wanted to be. They came to hear the words of the apostles. They came to hear the words of the apostles because they believed that those were from Christ. They were the words of Christ that had been given to them and trusted them to give to the people. 
They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. We no longer have the apostles with us today, but we do have the apostles' doctrine. The New Testament, the Bible, is the apostles' doctrine. You realize every single book of the New Testament was written by one of the apostles or one of the people who were so close to the apostles that they were just writing down what the apostles were saying. Right. Yeah. It, this, this book represents, especially the New Testament, represents the apostles' doctrine. We have it today. And we gather here together every week to do what? To continue in this. And the apostles' doctrine. We're, we're committed to each other, but in a greater sense, we're committed to this doctrine. And this doctrine is what commits us to each other. We, we all believe and hold in, in the same esteem this book as the word of God and believe that it is necessary for our lives. And so we gather together in some ways as a book club that every week opens the same book and goes to a different place and, and, and learns of the apostles' doctrine. We no longer have the apostles' presence, but we do have their doctrine. And it says that they continue the apostles' doctrine and their fellowship. We don't have the apostles' fellowship directly because they're not with us anymore. But we have it indirectly in this stream of, of commitments that have happened over centuries that we call the church. When you join a church, when you are baptized, or when you join yourself to a church, you are joining yourself to the Apostles' Doctrine and their fellowship. Because you are associating yourself with the very same organization that those men started all those years ago. I, I believe that there is an unbroken line of fellowship connecting what we do here today in the church to those very early days. To Peter and John and to Paul and to Timothy. We are, in essence, joining into their fellowship. We're continuing the things that they started and we're, we are associating ourselves with them by being the church today. There are organizations today uh, like the Sons of the Confederacy or Sons of the Union veterans. And it's people who have traced their ancestry back to the Civil War and found out what side their ancestors were on <laughs> and then joined themselves. They're in a, they, they join this organization as a connection to the past to say that, hey, I am a part of what my great, 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 great ancestors were a part of. Maybe not, maybe not that many greats the Civil War wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Seems like it. But they're connecting themselves to the past based on their ancestry. And when you join the church, you are, in essence, you are connecting yourself to the past. You're connecting yourself to the apostles. Not through direct blood ancestry, but through spiritual ancestry. Right. Just to, to, to say that, that they spiritually are my great-great-grandfathers. You're joined to that family, and you can connect yourself to, to that. When you join Dearborn Baptist Church, I, I hope that in your mind you're not just joining something local here, but, but you're connecting yourselves to a long line of church history. You're connecting yourselves to the legacy of the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship that has existed since that day and has endured persecution and tribulation, has endured scattering, and has continued to live and continued to thrive and continued to live in every country of the world. What a legacy we join ourselves to in church membership. You see why it's a little more than a card in your wallet? It is continuing in their fellowship and their doctrine. The content of a church is important. There are a lot of things we could do to be an attractive church. That's why I said we talk about being a compelling church. There's a lot of things. We want to be an attractional church. We want to be a church that does things that people want to come and join. We're going to do some fun things. We're going to do some interesting things, some exciting things. But any activity that we do that is not tied to the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship, the Word of God itself, is ultimately empty because of this. The way that you attract someone is the way that you then have to keep them. If we attract people just on fun and, and a light show and some smoke and some bubbles and I don't know, what, what, whatever else fun thing we want to do, uh, we can draw a crowd of people. But if they come for a light show, they're going to stay for a light show but if people come for the word of God 
and they'll stay for the word. Right. Amen. We want people to come here for the right reasons. We want people to stay here for the right reasons. Yeah, right. We don't want to trick anybody into being a member here. Right. We want people to understand what this is, what they're doing. And we want them to, to, to do it for the right reasons. We want people to come because they want to associate themselves with the word of God and with the legacy of the apostles. We have compelling content. You know, you might think Netflix, Netflix thinks they have compelling content, but it's all empty. It's all empty. It'll it'll make you it'll keep your attention for hours and hours and hours, but it's not feeding you anything. Right. It's junk food. Yeah. It's empty, and, and not only is it not feeding you anything, it's actually corrupting you. Mm-hmm. It's actually rotting away at your soul and at your spirit. It's actually weakening your your will, breaking down some barriers. Some of that's on purpose. Absolutely, and, and it's it's designed that way. There's an agenda to it. Yeah. Nothing you watch, nothing, no media you consume. Is without agenda. Right. It all has agenda. It's all accomplishing something in your mind, whether you realize it or not. Mm-hmm. Our content here is the Word of God, which is designed. It, this 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 content has an agenda as well, mm-hmm. except it is an agenda that is to encourage and uplift to for for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished, totally prepared for every good work. Amen. That's yeah. the work that's going on in this book, and that's. That's the content that we promote. That's the content that we preach. And that is the content that we are going to keep at the center point of this church. Amen. They had compelling conversions. They had compelling commitment. They had co- compelling content in the Word of God being preached every single day. And they had compelling communion. Look at verse 42. Again, and you know, we're kind of still in verse 42 here. It says, They continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. What is breaking of bread here? It, it could be a reference to just general fellowship and eating together, but, but I believe, and, and, and most commentators believe, that that is a reference to the Lord's table. That what they were continuing steadfastly in was the doctrine and the fellowship, but they were continuing steadfastly to break bread in the manner that Jesus commanded them to. Jesus said, as oft as ye eat, as oft as ye drink, do this in remembrance of me. In the local church, we have two ordinances that have been given to us. The ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of the Lord's table. Some say communion. I don't think it's a wrong term. It's it's an acceptable term. But I prefer the term the Lord's table or the Lord's supper. Mm -hmm. Because it is done in connection with him. It's his ordinance. It's something he told us to do. And it's something that we do in obedience to him. It's something we do to remember him. They were faithful in observing communion in the way Christ had commanded amongst their fellowship of dedicated believers who had joined themselves to this church. And it was in that moment that they did what? They remembered the Lord's death. That's what communion is to do. That's what the Lord's table is designed to do, to remind us about the death of Jesus. A compelling church is one that keeps the cross and keeps the death of Jesus Christ in front of people's attention. You may not think uh, death to be a very compelling message, but if we would be a compelling church, the death of Christ ought to be our message. That the Apostle Paul said that this was the center of his message. This was all he came to preach. He said he determined not to know or not to preach anything among them except for Christ crucified. That's right. That was going to be the, the emphasis. That was going to be the focus. Every Everything that he preached was going to lead to, set up, promote, point to the fact that Jesus Christ gave his life. He sacrificed himself. He died for us. There ought not be a, a week of preaching that goes by that the death of Jesus Christ isn't mentioned or, or, or pointed to or, or taught in a class or something. It is the core of our message. We preach it, but we also remember it when we gather together at the Lord's table. Next week in our membership meeting, we'll talk more about how we will observe communion here at Dearborn Baptist Church. It's going to be different here in the hotel than it'll be in a building, and you know we'll we'll adjust on the fly as the Lord leads us uh, to go to different places. But but it is an activity that, as a local church, we will do. The the only reason why we have not committed ourselves to the regular partaking of of uh, baptism and of the Lord's table up to this point is up to this point we have not or yet really organized ourselves as an independent church and we have not added any members to our church yet 
But Easter Sunday, we will be adding members to the church. And once we add members to the church, now we have some people that we can sit down and we can have the Lord's table with. Amen. We can observe communion together. We can remember the Lord's death together. I'm excited for that. That is an, an exciting, compelling thing. And that day is coming once we follow these steps here of gladly receive, baptized, added to the church. Then what did they do? They regularly practiced the breaking of bread, which represented the body of Jesus Christ. And we will also follow in their footsteps and, and, and keep the Lord's table as a compelling memorial of the Lord's death. And we do that how long? Till he comes. Amen. Till he comes. We do it forever. We keep doing it. We keep doing it. We don't let ourselves forget what Jesus did for us. And communion is one way that we do that. We keep it in the forefront. And then the last point is that they had a compelling community. All of these elements together, salvation and baptism, the Lord's table, the word of God, th these are the elements that make a church a church. Right, these are the absolute essentials. We couldn't have a church if we left out one of those points. Acts 2.42 is like church in a nutshell right there. One little verse that kind of tells us like, these are the things that a church does. And without them, you don't have a church. These are essential activities. But we see some of the results of, of this compelling action. Where all of these ingredients were mixed together, it created something sweet. It created something compelling. The idea of communion by itself, or the idea of baptism by itself, or the idea of just a Bible study, you know, um, all may be good things by themselves, but they're ingredients that when they come together, and they're, they're mixed up together in, in the right way, in the right format, with the right spirit, it becomes something more together. Like the, you know, you, you can take all the ingredients of a cake and eat them separately, and it's not very good, <laughs> you know? Butter is great when it's in a cake, but you know, by itself, it's it's not very attractive. But we get all these ingredients together in the church, and it becomes a pretty compelling organization. It becomes something that is different from anything else in the world. It becomes something that is worthy of giving ourselves to, worthy of our membership, worthy of our allegiance, worthy of our lives. We desire that here at Mark Baptist Church would be compelling in that way, but it won't be compelling in that way without the proper ingredients, mm -hmm. without a proper understanding of baptism, without proper understanding and practice of the Lord's table, without a proper value and emphasis on church membership. These are important elements that when they come together, create this environment that people were adding to the church daily. And it was growing. And look at some of the other things that they did. We read in verse 43 through 47, kind of this compelling community that was created by these activities of the church. It says, fear came on every soul. Wonders and signs were done by the apostles. God was doing miracles in their presence. And I believe that God will do miracles in our presence. He already is doing miracles in our presence. And he will do more miracles in our presence. Verse 44, they that believed were together and had all things common. It created a great unity of spirit. We read that, verse 45, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. I talked two weeks ago about being a compassionate church. This was a compassionate church. Right. These people were compassionate to the level that they sold their own things to give to other people who had needs. They saw poor people and they saw people who were afflicted and they even saw people once they admit they had needs to where they were giving them the clothes off their back. They were sacrificing their own things to give to other people. That kind of compassion is compelling. That kind of compassion is something that ought to define Christian people. In verse 46, it says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. It says that they went house to house breaking bread. These people liked gathering together as the church, but they liked gathering together outside of the church. They liked going over to each other's houses and eating together, having meals and, and fellowshipping together. This is a compelling community. This is a com community that was so compelling, the Bible says in verse 47, that they had favor with all the people. 
would that I, I wish that that would be something that could be said of Dearborn Baptist Church, a church that favors all people, that people in the community, first of all, know about us. That was our first message, that we would be a, a church that is known, but a church that is well known, a church that has favor with all the people, even people that uh, aren't associated with the church, even people that are associated with other churches, or people that are parts of other religions would have a, a beautiful picture of the church based on the way that we live, the way that we love each other, the way that we fellowship, the way that we take care of each other, that it would be a, an attractive, a compelling picture of the gospel to people who are watching. Because people are watching. And we ought to live in such a way that we represent Christ to a community in a way that we would have favor with all the people. The Bible says, when a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies will be at peace with him. That's right. Mm. If you live in such a way that pleases God, you can even make the haters have some respect. Those people who are against everything you believe still can't say anything bad about you because they see that you're real right. and that they, they, they can have a level of respect for the gospel, for the church. That is a compelling church. And if we have all these things in order, and we have the proper doctrine, we have the proper practice, and we can join ourselves together in that, under those, in that context, that we would be a church that could have favor with all the people. Hmm. It says that they were praising God, having favor with all the people, and then the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. You realize it's not our <laughs> responsibility to grow the church? It's our desire. We want the church to grow. We're going to do activity. We're going to invite people to church. We're going to go visit people. We're going to advertise in the community. But ultimately, the Lord adds to the church. Sure. The Lord does it. Yeah. But the Lord does it in the context where everything is being done properly here. In the proper context. When, when, when everything is done to praise the Lord and have favor of all the people and they're they're have the right content, they have the right doctrine, they have the right spirit, they have the right fellowship, then the Lord adds to that church. Why? Because it's a place that can be trusted. The Lord's not going to send people to a place where they're going to be discouraged. The Lord's not going to send people to a place where they're going to be deceived. The Lord's going to bring people to a place where the gospel is preached, where the word of God is central, where the love of Christ is demonstrated, where they are going to be added to the church. A place that is going to be faithful to disciple. A place that's going to be faithful to baptize. A place that's going to be faithful to, to observe the Lord's table in proper context. That is the place that the Lord is going to bless. That is the place that the Lord is going to add people to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. I thank you so much for this compelling picture of the early church. I just pray that, Lord, you would continue to add people to this church. Lord, you've already done it. You've brought people in. And, uh, Lord, whether it's through our activity or through simply the Spirit's leading, Lord, we are thankful for every person that has come. And I, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in these things, that we would be a place that reflects the proper spirit and has the proper doctrine. And, uh, Lord, that Dearborn Baptist Church would be a place where the apostles themselves would feel at home because it's the same word of God that's being preached. And uh, Lord, I pray that as we continue to grow, Lord, that we would keep the commitment to these things. And I pray that Dearborn Baptist Church would be a, a church that has favor of all the people. Lord, a good reputation, known for good works in the community. And I, I pray that our love for you and love for each other would be known. We ask these things in Christ's precious and holy name.